Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum audience, dear viewers, dear listeners. Welcome to another episode of The Scholar and the Student. Today we have a Ramadan special lined up for you. Inshallah, by the time this is released, Ramadan will only be a few days away. So if you are wondering how to best prepare for Ramadan in the few days that you have left or few hours that you have left, if you're listening to this even later, we have a very special guest coming back to the show after almost one year, after getting me in trouble because of some of the statements that he mentioned, but it's all fair game, alhamdulillah. That's what you get for rocking the boat. Brothers, sisters, and everyone else in the audience, please welcome back to the scholar and the student, Sheikh Ismail Kamdar. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. How are you doing? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I'm well. And yourself, brother? Alhamdulillah, doing well, doing well. And as we were saying before we went live, we are doing our best to adjust to the new normal that the pandemic has ushered in. In fact, the pandemic was raging on last Ramadan as well. And it seems that this Ramadan, it will also continue raging on. We ask Allah to make things easy for us and take us out of this pandemic, Amin. At the same time, we acknowledge that this is the way things are going to go for a little while longer. So that is why one of the reasons why we wanted to have this Ramadan special to see how best we can conduct ourselves in this blessed month. So Sheikh Ismail, let's get straight to the crux of the matter. We've been hearing for quite a while from many Islamic scholars, yourself included, you've given some Jum'ah khutbas on this subject that we should prepare for Ramadan in advance, you know, from the month before from Shawwal, sorry, from Sha'ban and all these things. So getting into the mood of fasting, perhaps taking our intake of food lower. But now as we are recording this episode and as this episode is being released, there are literally just a few days left until Ramadan begins. So if people have not already started lowering their food intake or they haven't already started getting into the mood of fasting by fasting on Mondays and Thursdays, for example, or the three days of every month, then how best can we kickstart our Ramadan journey? Okay, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah. So, you know, um, everybody, I think, who's listening to this already understands that Ramadan is meant to be the month of uh, supercharging our iman, you know, taking us to the next level. And, uh, you know, preparation for Ramadan begins with increasing our ibadat in the, in the months or rather the days leading up to Ramadan. Uh, now, as for someone who's starting a bit late, like just a few days before Ramadan begins, what can you do? Well, there's still quite a bit you can do. Uh, uh, number one is make your goals, right? Uh, decide what you're going to focus on this Ramadan. So this is this is something I do every year. Uh, I, I sit down before Ramadan and I make a list of things that I want to accomplish this Ramadan. Things like how many times I want to complete reciting the entire Quran, uh, you know, uh, how much charity I want to give, uh, which masjid I'm going to for Taraweeh, um, anything else, make a dua list. That's important because this is a month when our duas are answered. So make a list of things that you need to make dua for and that you want to make dua for so that when you are making dua in Ramadan, you're not sitting and thinking, you already know what you want to, what you want to say, right? Uh, so that, that's another important step. Uh, another important step would be to just increase your daily ibadat, right? So a simple thing we can do is after Isha, before praying our witr, Pray two or four rakats of Qiyamulay. Two or four rakats. So what you're doing is you, you're building up your, your, your body is becoming accustomed to praying extra night prayer after Isha before the winter. So the Tarawi is not just something sudden and, 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 and hard on you. It, it's something you've been building your, your body to, to be able to handle. Uh, so that prepares you physically, mentally, and spiritually for Ramadan because you're now building the habit of, uh, of praying extra. So, you know, in this week, instead of just praying your Isha and your Witr, pray your Isha, your Sunnah, some Qiyamul Layl, and then Witr. So you are getting ready for Tarawi in that way. Uh, another thing that you can do is uh, start figuring out who you're going to give charity to, how, how are you going to handle your charity in Ramadan? Because this is the aspect of Ramadan that many people forget. It's, it's meant to be the month of, of Sadaqah. That the Prophet Sallallahu was more generous in, in, in Ramadan than in every other month. The hadith describes it like a hurricane in terms of how, how generous he was. So, you know, one of the things I like to encourage is find a way to give every single day. For every single night of Ramadan, give something. So if you've got just 3,000 for giving away, just give 100 a day instead of giving all of it in one day. 
you know, so that every day of Ramadan, you're getting the reward of giving charity. So you need to work that out. How much do I have to give? Uh, you know, how much can I afford to give? Who am I going to give it to? What channels I'm going to use? You don't want to be scrambling last minute to look for that. Uh, it's one of those things that you can plan. Uh, other ways that you can benefit, you know, uh, which uh, lecture series I'm going to listen to. That's a, a new thing in our times. You know, we have these YouTube Ramadan lecture series, uh, which are, alhamdulillah, very beneficial. So deciding which one you're going to follow uh, so that you, and what time you're going to listen to it, that's also something that you could add to your daily schedule. So yeah, those are a few things that we could do in the upcoming days to prepare ourselves spiritually for the blessed month of Ramadan. MashaAllah, that's very profound. And when it comes to charity in particular, I'm sure since you do a lot of work with these institutes such as Yaqeen, you might, and maybe some of our audience might have heard of this platform called Launch Good. I believe that's what it's called. And it's got this interesting system where you can automate your charity being given to whichever charity. I'm sure they have an, a list of options over there. And whether it's all the nights of Ramadan or the last 10 nights of Ramadan, you choose your pick. You can automate that every night I'm going to give maybe $1 or $3 or whatever it is. So I think that's an interesting and very convenient way for some of the audience members to actually engage in giving charity. And you mentioned about um, completing the Quran and all these other things which we do. And we'll get to Taraweeh as well. I would like you to demystify Taraweeh because many of us growing up, we've kind of taken Taraweeh to be this if it's not 20 rakats, then it's, it's as good as not reading taraweeh and things like that. But before we get to that, when it comes to recitation of the Quran, I interact with some people and they tell me that, oh, this Ramadan, we intend to um, make a khatam, we intend to complete the Quran three times. I'm like, okay, mashallah. But I also know for a fact, and I'm not casting aspersions because they will tell me this themselves, that after Ramadan, they will probably never open the Quran like ever until next year Ramadan inshallah if Allah gives us life so my approach to this and I'm not saying I'm better than anyone or it's right or wrong what I do is that this happened last year as well I could not manage to complete the reading of the Quran but what I did is that I gave priority to memorizing the Quran and when you're memorizing it it does take more time than you just reading through one juz um, blazing through it and so on and so forth so what I personally prefer to do is I read like a quarter of a juz, like as devotional reading. And then the rest of the time I have in the morning, whether it's an hour or half an hour before I go to work, I try to devote that to memorizing the Quran. So do you think that this is something that is feasible? Would you recommend it to others? And over and above that, would you recommend others to have more of a personalized plan as opposed to the general, I'm going to complete the Quran reading twice or thrice in this month and then be burnt out after the month ends? Okay, well, firstly, uh, it is the practice of the Salaf to increase their Quran recitation in Ramadan, right? Uh, any of the pious predecessors whose lives that you read, uh, they all had this practice that in Ramadan they would recite the Quran as many times as possible. So uh, that's something that's there. That's part of our, uh, our legacy. It's a good thing. Uh, but it's not meant to be just a recitation for the sake of recitation. Uh, the verse in the Quran that mentions the word Ramadan, it's only mentioned once in the Quran, talks about the Quran. Right? So in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse 185, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. That the month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed, hudalli nas, as guidance for mankind. So right there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, the month of Ramadan is when the Quran was revealed as a guidance for mankind. So Ramadan is meant to be about the Quran, and that's meant to be a means of guidance for us. So if our recitation of the Quran in Ramadan is not increasing us in guidance, it's not making the Quran uh, the means of guidance in our lives, then there is something wrong in how we are reciting the Quran. So I would give different people different advice on how to approach the Quran in Ramadan, depending on where you are at spiritually. My advice to someone who has never recited the Quran with understanding in their life is to dedicate this Ramadan to just reciting the Quran once, but with understanding. So reading it with a translation or reading it uh, and listening to a tafsir of it or, or something like that, just once with understanding uh, would help fulfill that purpose of Hudal Nas 
better than reciting the entire Quran from uh, cover to cover multiple times and still not understanding a single surah. But for someone who already has done that in the past, and Alhamdulillah, someone who's familiar with the message of the Quran and who's, who's practicing Islam, uh, then, you know, it really depends on, on, on what you can handle. Uh, some people recite the entire Quran twice in Ramadan, some three times, some use it for memorization, some use it for pondering on the Quran, some use it for learning tafsir. The main thing is to be engaging with the Quran. The main thing is that your number one priority is spending time with the Quran. And as long as you are benefiting from that, as long as that is helping you get closer to Allah, become a better Muslim, then Alhamdulillah, keep doing what you're doing. But if you feel the way you are engaging with the Quran is not really benefiting you, meaning after Ramadan, you just go back to the way you were, then perhaps it's time to try something different. Still sticking with the Quran, but just a different approach to it. Right? So a few years ago, uh, I made a, a, a goal in Ramadan that I'm going to make Quran recitation a daily habit for the rest of my life. That was my goal for Ramadan. And Alhamdulillah, since then until now, with the exception of weekends and maybe vacations, uh, I recite Quran every day. Every day, right? That was a Ramadan goal I made for myself. I, I forced it on myself. I pushed myself to it. And now it's become such a habit that I can't go a day without reciting Quran. It's a part of who I am now. And this is something I encourage everybody to do because Quran recitation is not meant only for Ramadan. Ramadan is when you're supposed to increase. So if you're reading two Jews a day in Ramadan, you should be reading at least 10 minutes a day outside of Ramadan. Uh, to, uh, to ignore the Quran for 11 months is, is disrespectful to the Quran. That really, it's disrespectful to the Quran. It should be something that is recited and reflected on every single day of our lives. So that's one habit I would push people to try and, and, and revive is that Yes, in Ramadan, we will do more. We will do two or three Jews a day. But outside of Ramadan, try and build a habit of five or ten minutes a day. That will have a far stronger impact on your life than just reciting in Ramadan alone. Allah knows best. MashaAllah. Very insightful and very concise to the point advice on how we can build a relationship with the Quran. But since you gave your own personal goal into this would you be comfortable sharing with the audience what a typical day in ramadan looks like for sheikh ismail kamdar i know we haven't gotten there yet and it might be different this year as it was last year compared to every other year before that because of this pandemic but we all know that in ramadan we have struggles managing our energy our time our sleep because all of those are like in a deficit for obvious reasons so how do you personally deal with these deficits okay so no, the one problem with, with revealing my timetable would be that exposing my good deeds. <laughs> uh, I prefer to keep my good deeds hidden even more than my sins. Uh, sure. But uh, yeah, just general, because I guess this would, would help others to do the same. Uh, so in Ramadan, I'd usually start my day about an hour before Fajr. Uh, wake up about an hour before Fajr, pray some Qiyamul Layl and, and some Witr. Uh, and then, you know, maybe either Zikr or, or, or Quran until... Uh, Seri time, Suhoor time, then eat a meal with the family, wake up as the family, eat meal together, pray Fajr with my kids, send my kids back to bed for a couple hours before school starts, and that time goes in reciting Quran. So reciting Quran for about an hour after Fajr. Uh, again, it's uh, in South Africa, it's, it's like autumn or winter, Ramadan at the moment, so uh, Fajr is quite late. So by the time you finish reciting Quran, it's already 6 a.m., it's already work time. So... Then work hours, right? So say from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. goes in work and homeschooling my kids and, and our regular duties. And by the time we're done with that, we have like an hour left until iftar. That hour I would normally spend uh, either in, you know, uh, reflecting on the Quran or reciting some more. So I try to recite two Jews a day, maybe one after Fajr, one uh, after Asr. After Maghrib, uh, go to the Masjid for Taraweeh. Uh, I, I also will be doing a lecture before Tarawi every night this year. So like five minutes explanation of the Jews. Uh, that's a bit of a challenge, but I'll be doing it inshallah. Uh, and then after Tarawi, uh, I relax. Uh, need time to relax, right? <laughs> so uh, this is something I do that a lot of people uh, may say, you know, but you're supposed to be spending all your time in Ibadat. Uh, 
I notice people who who set off for that all the time in ibadat goal, by the tenth night of Ramadan they burnt out. Mm. Right. So one way that I manage to maintain uh, momentum throughout Ramadan is from day one I set relaxing time. So I do have an hour or two a day just to chill, just to relax with the family and and just do fun things, halal fun things of course, and relax. And then you know, go to sleep. So you know, so say say from ten p.m. to four a.m. sleeping, right? Getting that's enough sleep the, that we need uh, to, to get through the day. Uh, the only thing that really gets to me in Ramadan is the lack of coffee. Really, <laughs> that that's what gets me. So, uh, one cup of of coffee uh, when I wake up for Qiyamul Layl, another at at Suhoor time, and one at Iftar time. That that keeps me going. Alhamdulillah, that that's enough. It's only that like from midday to four p.m. you really feel the lack of of caffeine. Really, and well, I thought I was a coffee connoisseur, but I rarely go uh, like one cup in the morning. If I do more than that, that's really rare for me. But, mashallah, I and I've been seeing that this is a trend. Even Sheikh Omar Suleiman, he always mentions that every year in the lead up to Ramadan, he also weans himself off of coffee. Um, I don't know if this will be beneficial for you, Sheikh, but personally, I drink bulletproof coffee. Have you heard of that? Okay, so it's since I have mentioned to you on Instagram before that I do the ketogenic diet. So bulletproof coffee is part of the ketogenic diet. And recently, I've been having it cold as well, instead of warm. And that's mostly because my blender is not supposed to actually take in warm liquids. But anyway, it tastes good when it's um, chilled as well. It tastes like a milkshake or whatever. So it's basically coffee mixed with I use coconut oil and MCT oil, you can even put some ghee or some butter in there. So it's got a very good fat content. And I'm not a scientist, but what it does is that because of that fat content, the caffeine releases into your body gradually. So it's not like, I'll, it's not like a punch in your face, like energy, just one shot, it will release gradually. So if you have it, Seri ends like what, five o'clock, let's say nowadays. So if you have it towards the end, maybe even by 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, you will still be feeling it coming out because it's being released gradually into the body you can do more research and all that but that's personally what i do and what i have been doing alhamdulillah and it's been to some benefit alhamdulillah but once again honing in on you Sheikh, we know that you are an author and you've written a couple of books on a variety of subjects in fact you just finished um publish did you finish publishing or writing one just recently uh, I finished writing two books recently. Uh, one's uh, going to be released by Yakin Institute in Ramadan. And another one I'll be self-publishing in May or June, inshallah. Inshallah. May Allah put blessing into that. But I wanted to say that besides reading the Quran, many of us have got other reading lists during the month of Ramadan. So basically, I'm allowing you to do some self-promotion on this podcast over here. Tell us about the books that you've published they're on various different subjects, such as the life of Omar bin Abdul Aziz. I think that's the one I bought recently on my Kindle at the back there. So I'll get to it, inshallah. And others like getting the barakah, getting blessings and so on and so forth. Tell us about your books and where we can find them. So as readers or sorry, as listeners of this podcast, as people who watch my podcast, they can also go and order it on their Kindle or their laptop. So they also have something else to read during the month of Ramadan. And if you have any other recommendations of books that you have not written yourself, do let us know about that. Sure, inshallah. Okay, so alhamdulillah, I've written over a dozen books. Uh, alhamdulillah. And my goal in life is hopefully to write at least 100 books uh, before we leave this world because for me books are a source of sawab e jari. that's really the main reason we write them uh, so that uh, we can continue receiving good deeds long after we die so may Allah accept that from us uh, you know the the books I've written thus far there's one which I, I promote every year Ramadan time because it I, it was written in Ramadan for Ramadan and that's themes of the Quran right so themes of the Quran is available uh, this is the South African edition there's different covers in different parts of the world uh, all of my books are available in ebook format from my website, islamicselfhelp.com, also from Gumroad and Payhip. Uh, these are ebook stores where you can buy my ebooks. Uh, all of my ebooks are available there, uh, whichever ones I will copyright over. Um, and yeah, they're available for like $5, $10. Uh, for those asking why it's not free, because I am a self published author and I need to pay for my coffee as well, right? So, Whatever money you send me, Alhamdulillah, I make do of everybody who buys from me. It's, yeah. it's I'm grateful for that, right? Uh, 
they're also available via Amazon. So from Amazon, you could get the Kindle edition or the paperback edition. And what I've also done is I've set up distribution channels across the world. Or I'm still working on that. So right now, I have a South African publisher who's doing local prints on my book. I have someone in Bangladesh doing the same. Same in India. Uh, I'm working on that for Kuala Lumpur from Malaysia at the moment. So setting up a partnership there with a local publishing house. Uh, I'm also trying to get it into Saudi and UAE at the moment. So my goal is in every country to have a, a, a independent distribution channel just for that country. Uh, but right now, the, the main way to get it anywhere in the world is Amazon or the ebook from my website. So, you know, I've written a book on time management, on self-confidence, on Omar bin Abdul Aziz. Uh, and um, the one that, that, that I really promote this time of the year is Themes of the Quran. So this book, basically, I summarize the theme of each Jews of the Quran in about two to five pages. So you just have to read two or five pages a day for all of Ramadan and you get a summarized tafsir of the entire Quran. And I wrote it during the month of Ramadan a few years ago. So like every day I just wrote those two or two, five pages. And Alhamdulillah, every year in Ramadan, hundreds of people buy it. And, and I get a lot of messages from people telling me how much they benefited from it. In fact, just last week, somebody ordered 20 copies and had to go drop it off by their house for distribution. No. So Alhamdulillah, these books, people are benefiting from it. May Allah accept it from us. Uh, it's unique in that it, it's a thematic tafsir. I don't know if you know what thematic tafsir is. It's... It's um, one of the more newer styles of tafsir. Okay, so is that when you take a, a theme from a certain um, surah, for example, and then explain on that, or is it something similar? Yeah, so basically, the, my, my approach is I, I look at the Jews from, from a bird's eye view. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the main theme that keeps reoccurring in this Jews? Right? So, so like, for example, I explained, the, the, uh, let's look at one here. Uh, so, for example, Jews 5, which covers surah and nisa, uh, I put for the theme society. So he talks about caring for the orphans, caring for the widows, marriage, dealing with, with non-Muslims, you know, dealing with inheritance, dealing with polygamy. So what's the theme? The theme is society and societal law. And so I explain all of that, you know, in the book, like how all of it comes together uh, for one overarching theme. Uh, so you know, this is a, 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 a this is actually a new approach to tafsir that became popular in the past hundred years. And it's one that I'm, I'm very fascinated with. Um, it, it's really uh, a very interesting approach it actually came about as a response to the orientalists mm. right that uh, the orientalists were saying the quran is incoherent it's just randomly talking about different topics one after the other there's no themes there's no structure so in response to them ulama started writing tafsir showing how coherent the quran actually is they hold on the further you zoom out the more you're able to see the links between every verse and every surah and 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 you know you, you the, the deeper you dive you dive into it the more themes you discover, the more coherence you discover. Uh, so I find this approach very fascinating. So this was my attempt at it. There are much better attempts out there. Uh, there's uh, Muhammad Al-Ghazali's book on thematic tafsir. Uh, there's uh, the best ones are in Urdu, unfortunately, not in English. Uh, can't remember the author's name. Uh, just slipped out of my mind right now. But really, the, it's called the Dabur Quran. Uh, it's it's a really really brilliant thematic tafsir, but it's it's written in Urdu. It hasn't been translated into English yet. Uh, but again, it's a new field, so uh, there isn't that much available in it yet. But really, that's the main book I promote. Like, if you want to read one of my books, that's Ramadan, uh, Themes of the Quran. If you want more, uh, I have currently on sale on my website my ebook bundle. That's ten of my books, including this one in ebook format for thirty dollars. So that's ten ebooks for thirty dollars. That's best value for money you can get. You'll get my time management book, my self-confidence book, my Quran ebook, and about seven others as well. So yeah, that, that's that's something that, that, that uh, I'm promoting uh, at the moment. Also, you know, just keep your eye on the Yakin Institute website because within a week they will announce a new free ebook by me for Ramadan. Uh, that's very relevant to Ramadan, inshallah. So so when that hits the market, you can download that for free from Yakin Institute, inshallah. Mashallah. So you heard it here, folks. We'll be sure to keep those links down in the description inshallah links to Sheikh Ismail's books as well as this new free one that will be coming out this Ramadan inshallah just a, as a little tangential note Sheikh what about doing some readings which are not inherently religious so for example people might have a few fiction books on their shelves that they want to use to get into that habit of reading because they have not developed the habit of reading so now Ramadan has come yes you will read the Quran you will read all the books that you've mentioned but to get into the habit even more, you might have to start with something more enjoyable. So 
would you recommend that they should start this in the month of Ramadan as well? Well, I actually wouldn't because, you know, there's the story that Imam Malik, uh, in the month of Ramadan, he would close his muwatta and all the other hadith books and only sit to the Quran. And and the, the saying amongst the Salaf is, in this month, the Quran and nothing else. That that's 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 like the saying. Now, of course, people are different levels of their iman and different levels of this journey. Uh, what I would recommend is, if you're going to be reading fiction to get into the habit of reading, do that outside of Ramadan, so that by the time Ramadan comes around, you are in the habit of reading. Uh, because in Ramadan, you really want to focus on the Quran. And that's why even the books I promote for Ramadan are explanations of the Quran, tafsir of the Quran. It's all about the Quran. Ramad Ramadan is the month of the Quran. And, and you want that to be your, your the primary focus of your heart. Uh, I personally believe that Ramadan is a time for, for being the best version of ourselves. You know, some people, they look at this as like a type of hypocrisy. They're like, oh, you, you're so pious in Ramadan, but I'll say Ramadan, you're not like that. It's not hypocrisy. Ramadan has that effect on us. It it it, it supercharges our iman. Sh uh, shaitan is locked up. We are the best versions of ourselves in Ramadan, right? So it's not hypocrisy that in Ramadan you're not watching TV, but outside Ramadan you are. It's not hypocrisy if in Ramadan you're not reading fiction, but outside Ramadan you are. Uh, you are on a higher level in Ramadan. It's it's just natural. So there is nothing wrong with reading fiction. Uh, if you have some good fiction books, they can help get you into the habit of reading. That's excellent. But during the month of Ramadan, that's the time to just supercharge ourselves, like to, to be the best version of ourselves. So we can ride that Iman high throughout the rest of the year. Because remember, throughout the year, our Iman is, is dipping. It's dipping. So if, if we're going to start on a dip, we're going to be heading lower. But if we can like push ourselves to be the best version of ourselves for these 29 days, then we end Ramadan on a high note. And inshallah, by the next Ramadan, we're still okay. You know, I mean, we would have fallen a bit, but we still we still okay. We're not we're not in a dangerous territory yet. Yeah. So, yeah, that that would be my response to that. Allah knows best. Yeah, mashallah. Well, we still have a few days before Ramadan starts proper. So, if anyone wants to get into fiction, now is the time. So, by the time the first of Ramadan hits, we'll be able to read more explicitly Islamic books, if I may call them that. But now let's hone in on this topic of Taraweeh. Yourself growing up in a Hanafi environment, myself as well, we were kind of sold this dream or whatever it's called that if it's not 20 rakats, then it's not Taraweeh. And there are so many statements out there. And for myself in Botswana, I mentioned this to you before we started recording, we have a curfew until September. Well, that's apparently the law out, that we cannot be out of the house at eight. So this means that unless I live in the same yard as someone who is a hafil of the Quran, personally, I don't, then it's probable that I'm not going to actually be reading Taraweeh in the way that I have been doing in these past years, because I don't have access to reciting the whole Quran by memory like that. So also, we've got time constraints, people are busy and so on and so forth. Not everyone might be able to make that threshold of 20 rakats. So why don't you get into a bit of the fiqhi perspective and demystify what exactly Taraweeh is, and how we can approach to Taraweeh, and we shouldn't feel guilty if we can't make the full 20 rakats. Okay, so everything I'm about to say is very controversial. And I know I, I get into a lot of hot water every year for this. And I know that people have already made their minds up about this topic. So whoever's mind is made up, I can't convince them. And whoever is willing to listen, you know, I would say don't take my word for it. Open up the books and read for yourself and see for yourself. I mean, so, it's good that you put the first. disclaimer this time, Sheikh, because last time you did not put a disclaimer and we saw what happened. But it will take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people are still upset about me about the whole topic thing. But if they want, I can put my topic on for the rest of this, for the segment. And I'm perfectly fine with that. <laughs> I wait for you. Anyway, but this is more of a chilled out session. So it's mm. not on today. But... You know, Tarawi, this is one of the first things I got in trouble for as a young man. Because while I was doing my Alim program uh, under my teachers, I stopped praying 20 and started praying 8 while I was still studying with them. And that was a huge uproar. That was like a mutiny on, uh, on my part, betrayal. And one of the reasons I had done that is I had opened up the earliest possible Hanafi books I could find. Uh, I opened up Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani's narration of the Muwatta of Imam Malik. So Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani is Imam Abu Hanifa's student. 
right? He's one of the three main Imams of the Hanafi Madhab. Uh, a lot of our fiqh comes from him. But he also was a student of Imam Malik. So there's a narration of the Muwatta from Imam Muhammad, where he narrates the Muwatta, but he explains the Hanafi perspective. So I opened to the chapter on Tarawi. Firstly, the word Tarawi doesn't exist back then. The open, I opened to the chapter on praying at night in Ramadan. That's what he called it. And he narrates from Imam Malik the Hadith of 11 Rakat. And then he says, our opinion. Now, when he says our opinion, he means himself and Abu Hanifa. He says, our opinion is that it is permissible to pray at night in Ramadan as a nafil. So he didn't mention any rakats. He didn't say sunnah muakidah. He said it's permissible, meaning it's not a bid'ah, because that was the debate back then, people saying it's a bid'ah. And he said nafil. He didn't, you know, so, and so that's just like, what? Imam Muhammad is saying this. Today's Hanafi are saying 20 rakats, nothing less, sunnah al muakida sin if you don't do it. There's, there's, there's like a discrepancy. Some, some, something's not right here. So I spent many, many years doing research on this topic. And my conclusion is that, firstly, the term tarawih is not something used by the early Muslims. It's permissible to use. There's nothing wrong with using it. It's just not a term used by the early Muslims, right? It's the same with the Hajjid, by the way. They would refer to both prayers as Qiyamul Layl. That's the term they use, Qiyamul Layl, for both what we call Tahajjud and what we call Tarawi. So they did not regard it as two separate salahs. Uh, in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he only prayed in Jamaat three times in Ramadan. And when they asked him why he's not praying in Jamaat, he said, I don't want it to become an obligation upon you. Meaning what? Meaning it's nothing, right? And this is the part that I get upset with, is that those ulama who are like forcing it on people and telling them you are sinful if you don't do it, whatever terminology they're using, the fact that you are forcing people to do it and saying they're sinful if they don't, goes directly against the wishes of Rasulullah uh, He himself stopped doing it because he didn't want it. He knows people won't be able to handle that. He knew if it was an obligation, people wouldn't be able to handle it. That's why he stopped doing it. He wanted to make the religion easy for us. And then we turned it around and made the religion difficult on ourselves. So what is Tarawi? Qiyamul Layl, Tahajjud, or Tarawi, whatever you want to call it, Qiyamul Layl is the greatest act of Nafil Salah that we can pray. It is the greatest Salah we can pray after the five part. The most important, the best for our Iman. It's something that we pray in and out of Ramadan. In Ramadan, there is special rewards for it. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever prays the nights of Ramadan with Iman and seeking Allah's reward, all of their past sins are forgiven. That's a huge reward. Right? Notice he doesn't mention any number of rakats. He simply says, whoever spends the night in prayer. Now, when you go back to early Islam, you see three things. Number one, they don't distinguish between Qiyamul Layl, uh, uh, Tahajjud, and Tarawi. They treat all three as the same. Uh, you see this with Sahih al-Bukhari, you see this with uh, the Muwatta of Imam Malik, any early Islam, right? Number two, they treat it as a nafil salah, not as a sunnah al muakida The term sunnah al muakida was invented many centuries later, but for early Islam, it was considered nafil. Number three, they don't mention a specific number of raka. So in the past uh, 50 years, we've had this huge debate, 8 or 20, 8 or 20, right? Between the Salafis and the Deobandis, 8 or 20, 8 or 20. I would say both sides are wrong. It's whatever you want, whatever you can pray. Whatever you can pray, Iman or Wahtisaba, with Iman and with sincerity, that is your Qiyamul Layl. Right? For someone who is not used to praying and they just bring two or four rakats after Isha with sincerity for the sake of Allah, Allah will accept that from them. Right? So if you are in the habit of praying 20 rakats of Tarawi, MashaAllah, keep it up. Don't stop. That is an excellent habit. But if you're a young man who's not even praying five times a day, use this Ramadan to get in the habit of praying five times a day. Because the five daily salah is the second pillar of Islam. And Tarawi is a nafil. Establishing the second pillar of Islam is more important than praying a nafil salah. And this is what our community doesn't get. You know, that there are people who will force young people to pray 20 rakats of Tarawi, and the same young person is not praying Fajr, Zuhur, Asr, or Maghrib. What's the point? What's the point? We, we mix up our priorities, right? So if we go to the history of, of Tarawi, the time of the Prophet, 
He would pray by himself with his family. Only on three nights he prayed with the community. Time of Abu Bakr, the same. In the time of Umar, Umar notices that people were getting lazy with praying at night in Ramadan. So he started this thing that people would pray behind an imam in the uh, haram uh, after Isha. But he wouldn't do it himself. This is the point people must have. He actually never joined that jama'ah. He would pray by himself the hundred time instead because he found that to be better for his khushu and for his, uh, for his iman, right? So what this shows is that he didn't establish it as a fard or a wajib. He just put that option there for those people who, who are not going to wake up at the hajjah. At least they prayed at the hajjah early, right? For people who are not going to wake up for Qiyamul Layl, at least they pray Qiyamul Layl immediately after Isha. And this was the understanding of the first 200, 300 years of our history that people, uh, they would pray how much they want, when they want, or they would, you know, uh, go to the masjid. And you still see that in some countries today. For example, if you go to Saudi Arabia, uh, yeah, they have 20 rakats in the harem, but people are in and out, people are shopping, people come for four rakats, someone comes for eight rakats. You know, it's like there's no forcing people to be there for 20 rakats. Uh, people pray what they are able to pray uh, and, and, they, and nobody forces them to pray 20. The idea of forcing 20, anything less than that, then you are sinful, you will not find this idea anywhere in the Quran or in the Hadith or in the statements of the Sahaba. I guarantee you that. You will not find any verse in the Quran or Hadith or statement from a Sahabi saying that to pray less than 20 rakats of the Rawi is sinful. This is an idea that came much later. It's in the Hanafi Madhab. It's in the Shafi Madhab. But it came later. It's not in the early versions of the Madhab. In the later versions of the Madhab. Right? Right till today, in lands where people follow the Maliki Madhab and the Hanbali Madhab, you will find they have a more relaxed approach to the Rawi. Right? Same with the Ahli Hadith communities, the Salafi communities, they all have a more relaxed approach to Tarawi. It's only really mainly the, the Hanafi uh, Madhab uh, that's, that's made, made it so hardcore. And by the way, you know, one of the reasons why I bring this up is because it's not working. Right? Uh, with this generation, this enforcing Tarawi on young people is just not working. Because I don't know what it's like there, but here in South Africa, if you go to those masjids where they force young people to pray 20 rakats. You step outside the masjid, 90% of the young people are smoking and hanging out with their friends or going to coffee shops. Mm -hmm. Their parents think they're at the masjid, they're not at the masjid, right? It, it's not working. So instead of just forcing a child to pray 20 rakats or you're gonna slap him, you know, why not actually work on, on their iman? Why not actually work on developing their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You know, work on the five daily salah, work on, 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 on the fasting, work on the fara'id, work on that which is obligatory. Instead of just telling them, go to the masjid and don't come back until winter is over. It's not working. And it's, it's not the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They didn't, he didn't tell the young people to be in the masjid after Isha for 20 rakats. That's not something Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ever did. Right? He treated each person according to their level. And, and, and expect the people to pray, you know, according to whatever level they act, you know. And so we have to rethink this. I really believe that the way we approach Tarawi in our communities, it, it's firstly it goes against the wishes of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said, I don't want it to be an obligation upon you. It goes against the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that he never forced it on people or forced a specific number of raka on people. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's, 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 it's I mean, it works for some people, but not for everyone. So again, if you are someone who is praying 20 rakats tarawi and it's benefiting you and, and you get your iman boost from that and it brings you closer to Allah, don't stop. That is a great deed. That is a good deed. That's 20 rakats of nafil, all of which will count on your faith on the day of judgment. Just do it. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you are someone who is struggling to pray salah, use Ramadan to focus on your five daily salah instead. Get in the habit at least of praying five times a day because that's more important. Like praying five times a day for the for the rest of your life is more important than praying tarawih in Ramadan. I don't know why that should be a controversial statement. It shouldn't be a controversial statement at all. It's 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 just a matter of priorities. Unfortunately, people treat tarawih as if it's more important than Isha. And if you don't believe me, look at the amount of people in the masjid for Isha and the amount of people in the masjid for tarawih, and you realize how messed up our priorities have become. Yeah. No. MashaAllah, you put it so beautifully and went through all the evidences. So I think if anyone wants to take issue, then they can go to the classical books and sort this out that way, alhamdulillah. But now also on the topic of taraweeh and individual worship, I'm 
contemplating this scenario, there are plenty of our brothers and sisters who, okay, in terms of our sisters, maybe they are experiencing their periods during Ramadan. Maybe they are pregnant. So this means that they cannot pray like the rest of us. They cannot touch the Quran or perhaps one of our brothers is not terminally ill, but he's got an illness that prevents him from fasting. So for these people who have legitimate reasons for not praying and for not fasting, how can they make the best of this blessed month of Ramadan? Okay, so if you cannot pray or fast in Ramadan for whatever reasons, there are a lot of other things you can do, right? So starting number one with charity. Of course, we do know that for those who have chronic sicknesses or old age, automatically charity takes the place of fasting in the form of fidya, right? Uh, but even if you're not doing that, uh, on a daily basis, maybe preparing iftar for the community and, and distributing iftar amongst the poor. That's a great act of worship that's from the sunnah, right? Uh, zikr, remembering Allah, uh, listening to tafsir, listening to Quran. I mean, if you can't recite Quran because you are you know, on your monthly cycle, listen to Quranic recitation. Uh, you know, uh, so in, in my community, one of the habits that sisters would have is to watch the, the Tarawih for Makkah, watch it live on, on YouTube and listen to the Imam's recitation and, and follow the subtitles. They have the translation in subtitles, you know, so that's a very powerful Imam boost. You're listening to the Imam of Makkah or Medina reciting and you're reading the translation. It's a powerful way to spend your evenings if you can't pray Tarawih yourself, right? Um, dua, you don't, there's no conditions for Dua. You know, spend your Qiyamul Layl time in Dua. Remember in Ramadan, your Duas are answered at, at Qiyamul Layl time, at Suhoor time, at Iftar time. So, and there is no there is no condition for Dua. Like whether you are on your monthly cycle or you are sick or you are in, in old age or you are pregnant or whatever it is, your Duas are still going to be answered. So if, if nothing else, increase in your Dua time, right? While the rest of us are praying Tarawih, you can sit and make more Dua and get even more Duas answered than the rest of us. Right, so du'a, zikr, studying the deen, listening to Quran, uh, uh, reading Islamic books, and giving charity, uh, feeding the poor, distributing iftar, distributing suhoor, all of these are things that we can do uh, regardless of what state we are in, and they will all help us to boost our iman and take our Ramadan to the next level, inshallah. Inshallah. And speaking of du'a, have you heard of a course called Visionaire, Sheikh? Yes, yes, I've heard about it, yeah. Okay, have you ever been on it and taken it? Uh, no, no, I haven't been on it, not yet, no. Okay, well, I'm not sponsored for this audience, by the way, but one of the best uses of Ramadan that I can recommend to anyone is actually, maybe, Sheikh, you can also consider this, I know you're very busy this Ramadan, but the type of things that you learn in, in the course of Visionaire, it's not a simple how to make dua course, I can attest to the fact I've been taking Visionaire since 2016 or 2017, and it has helped me take my du'as literally to the next level. In fact, the fact that I am interviewing Sheikh Ismail Kamdar on my podcast here in Botswana is one of those dreams come true, and it was all by means of du'a. To, to think that someone whom I just, um, I saw once upon a time on Mad Mam Luke's, because I used to listen to a lot of podcasts, particularly Mad Mam Luke's, and then I see Sheikh Ismail from my neighboring country of South Africa. And then now twice that I've had him on my own show. This was once upon a time, nothing but a dream. But that dream came true because of Visionaire. And remember when it comes to dua, in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, one of those nights is going to be Laylatul Qadr. And if we make dua on Laylatul Qadr, then it's practically guaranteed acceptance. So, okay, we'll come to this now. So what I'm saying is that I'll leave a link down below for anyone who is interested in, in signing up for Visionaire. Inshallah, if you take my word for it, then you'll definitely experience the Iman boost of a lifetime, inshallah. Now then coming to Laylatul Qadr, Sheikh, how do we change our approach or tailor it compared to what we've been doing throughout Ramadan? What extra things do you recommend we do on Laylatul Qadr? Or how do we approach Laylatul Qadr to begin with since it's not fixed that this is the night of Laylatul Qadr? Hmm. Okay, so uh, for me, the best approach is to treat all of the last 10 nights as if it is Laylatul Qadr. You know, some people have this approach of, of looking for the signs. And only when they see certain signs, then they go full in. And then for the rest of the month, they do nothing because they say, I feel like I caught it already, right? So... This used to happen to me when I was younger, like on, a, on the 21st night or 23rd night, you see some of the signs and you're like, I think I caught Laetul Qadr already. For the rest of the month, I can take it easy. Uh, so a better approach is every single night, just tell yourself, 
tonight could be Laylatul Qadr. So I'm just going to worship Allah as if it is Laylatul Qadr. And inshallah, you'll get the reward either way because in the malamalu biniya, right? Your intentions according to your actions. I believe one of the wisdoms behind why Allah kept Laylatul Qadr hidden from us is that we spend all 10 nights in the worship of Allah. And why I'm saying 10 nights, not just the odd nights, is because how often do we mess up our, our calculations and end up starting Ramadan one day early, one day late? So it could be that the odd night is opposite to what we're looking at, right? Um, that we got our calculations wrong. And again, Allah will accept that from us because it's all ijtihad and you know, time is in many ways constructed by us, right? I mean, you know, our calendars are, are changing all the time. This is something humans made up, January, February, March, all of these things. But Allah accepts it from us based on our ijtihad. So if people have tried their best and a community have decided Ramadan starts on a certain day and another community decides Ramadan started the next day, Allah will accept from both. And, you know, the deed are valid for both. But just to be extra careful, you know, every year, the odd nights fall on opposite nights in different parts of the world. You know, so the 21st night in South Africa might be the, the 22nd night in Saudi Arabia, right? So just to catch it all, treat all 10 nights like they are special. And so once you hit the 20th of Ramadan, you just go into Superman mode, you know, like be the absolute best version of yourself for the next 10 days, because this is the, the 10 most important nights of the year. You know, if you catch this, it will carry you through the rest of the year. You know, last year in, in Ramadan, I remember in the last 10 nights, one of the du'as I was making uh, was Allah to open the door for me to do full-time writing and research. Right, that was actually a dua I was making. And not even four months later, I got the phone call from Sheikh Umar Salaman offering me the job of Yaqeen where I'm do I am now doing full-time writing and research. That's my job now. That's all I do all day, alhamdulillah. You know, so for me, that's like, wow. You know, you, you sit in Ramadan and you make a dua and it comes through in a way you never think about. Like that wasn't even in my mind. My mind's thinking maybe if I sell so many books, I can do it. Maybe if this happens, I can do it. Maybe if I, you know, get a I didn't even think about the fact of, that there's organization, organizations out there that could pay you to do it. It wasn't something that even crossed my mind. But Allah answers du'as in ways that you, that you, that you won't even uh, imagine, right? So, you know, whatever it is you want that, that, that you believe is beneficial for you in this world and the next, uh, it could be something really out there, you know, like you want your podcast to benefit millions of people so you can get the reward of all the good deeds on the Day of Judgment. So they make the du'a in Laylatul Qadr. I, I make the du'a for all 10 nights, right? Uh, and Inshallah, if it is good for you, Allah will open the doors for you. And if it is not good for you, Allah will give you something better than that. Right? Whatever is best for us. You know, one of the things that I just want to mention before you know we move on from that point is that when you uh, when you make du'a in in in, in uh, Ramadan, it, it, you know, or even when you when you're planning your goals, focus on things that are sawab jahriya. Focus on things that are going to benefit you long after you die. Because let, let, let's give you a scenario. Let's just say, um, Allah give us all long life, but just say one of us passes away from COVID within the next few months. What have we left behind to keep piling up our good deeds? Right? We don't know how long we have in this world. right? We don't know whether we're going to live a long life or a short life. How do we keep our good deeds going for hundreds of years? You see, your goals and your du'as should be linked to things that can keep your good deeds going long after you have passed away. That's one of the main reasons why I write books. Because historically, that's been one of the main ways in which good deeds just keep rolling for people. I mean, I always look at the books on my shelf and I think, wow, this book was written 500 years ago. This book was written 1,000 years ago. We're still benefiting from it. Imagine the ajr that the, that the author is getting. I want a piece of that, right? So I'm also going to write books. So... When you're thinking of goals, think sawab ajariya. Think what goal can I do that if I had to die, I can keep getting good deeds for it. And nowadays, thanks to technology, there's so many more things we can do. You know, in the past it was books, but now we've got podcasts, we've got videos, we've got so many other ways to benefit the ummah. Just focus on, even with your charity in Ramadan, don't just focus only on feeding people, but also look for sources of sawab ajariya, like maybe contributing to a masjid or contributing to an Islamic organization, or contributing to an Islamic school, or an orphanage. You know, something where the reward's going to keep rolling on for years to come. Right? Because we have to think beyond life. We have to think beyond death, especially when it comes to our good deeds. It's not enough just to focus on now and year. 
we have to think beyond that. Allah knows best. MashaAllah, very much to the point and also attesting to the fact how dua really can be life-changing. So whatever you guys want in life, as Sheikh said, if you believe it to be beneficial for you in this life and the next, go ahead and ask Allah for it and expect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala definitely will give it to you. If not in the way that you are asking, definitely he'll give you something even better than it. The thing about dua, Sheikh, is that it's an act of ibadah. So even if you're just sitting asking for, I don't know, maybe a brand new car or something like because your own car is messed up. The fact that you are asking Allah is a testament to your iman, that you acknowledge that, yeah, there are systems. I have to go to the car shop and buy it, for example. But Allah is our raza. Allah is the one who gives this. You know, I can actually tell you a good story about that, right? Yeah. So about oh. eight years ago, I was driving a car that was really, really, uh, really, really old and broken. And I wouldn't complain about it because I kept telling my family, you know, if you are grateful, Allah will give you more. So I'm only going to say good things about this car. But I used to spend the nights making dua for a new car. And my budget was very small. I didn't have the budget for a good car. And it just so happened that one night somebody gave me a call and, and this person told me, listen, he's got a car and he knows my, my, what my budget is. He'll sell me that car for that amount of money, even though it was worth double that amount of money. And so I sold my old car and I bought that car. I'm still driving it until today. But for me, that was my dua being answered. That he literally sold it for exactly the amount of money I had saved up to buy a car, even though when I took it for evaluation with the insurance, it was worth double that amount. SubhanAllah. Qadarullah, you know, the du'as are answered in ways you never imagined. And you don't have to go to a car shop. <laughs> SubhanAllah. So I, I usually don't use the word miracles, but maybe that word is very apt to describing the situations that we've been talking about, alhamdulillah. Anyway, coming back to Ramadan, Sheikh, we know that this year and last year as well, but let's look forward. The pandemic has changed the way we interact and so on and so forth. So for many people, myself included, we're not going to be having a communal Ramadan. I live, I'm the only Muslim in my yard, so I'll be praying on my own. Suhoor, iftar is all on me. I might have friends, but I need to be careful about when and how I see them because of the pandemic and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And this is a situation for many people out there in the globe. So how can we, first of all, perhaps experience that communal feeling of Ramadan this year? And over and above that, we don't know if we will be able to go home for Eid, and travel to see our friends and family. So in those cases, how mm. do we celebrate Eid in a communal manner? Because it makes sense to celebrate Eid with your family, with your friends, with your community. But that not for health reasons, for very good reasons, that's been restricted. How do we get around this? Well, I'm not really sure there is always a way to get around it. You know, sometimes Allah tests us with things and all we can do is have sabr and have rada bil qada, being pleased with what Allah has destined for us. Last year in Ramadan, uh, I didn't get to have iftar with my mom or my grandparents at all. In fact, you know, from the time the lockdown started until now, I only visited my grandparents once because health risk. You know, they both late 70s, early 80s. You don't want to mistakenly affect their health. You know, so phone them every week, but only visit them once. Uh, my mom obviously much more often than that. But last year Ramadan, we were like at level five lockdown, you know, the highest level of lockdown. We couldn't even visit family couldn't go for tarawi or anything so the way i look at it is if your country is at that level lockdown during ramadan allah wants you to engage in private worship just like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling you this ramadan is between you and me i normally ramadans with iftar parties and hanging out with your friends and going to the masjid this ramadan is just one-on-one -on -one, you and allah think of it as a khalwa as a private session with allah so flip it around right that Okay, we want to socialize in Ramadan, but we can't. Are we going to sit and mope and think, oh, you know, I can't be with my friends, I can't be with my family, or are we going to see the good in it? The good in it is you can now worship Allah more. You don't have to be rushing home from an iftar party, too full to go for tarawih. You don't have to be, you know, uh, one any of that. It's just you and Allah. It's as if, you know, the way I described it last year, it was as if Allah has forced us into itika for the entire month. Right? That we literally just us and Allah. So seeing the good in every situation, it's not always possible to get what we want in this world. So it may be for many people, they won't be able to see family this Ramadan. They won't be able to go for tarawih this Ramadan. They won't be able to, to be with their friends this Ramadan. We use that time to be with Allah instead and to ask Allah for what we want. Alhamdulillah, we live in the age of technology. We can still video call our family members. We can still do things like this. 
right? Can you imagine if we were going to Ramadan during the plague of Amwas or the Black Plague or something like that? We wouldn't see anybody or hear from anybody for months. And, and by the time you go to visit a family member, the news would have reached you that 100 family members have died and you didn't even know about it, right? Allah has blessed us with technology that has made this, this difficult situation manageable. So we thank Allah for that. And we use that in a way that's beneficial. And so we will speak to our family members or, or through video calls and things like that. If it is safe, we will visit. Uh, if not, we take this as our private time with Allah, Allah and we engage in as much ibadah as possible. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. So excellent advice that we can all take on board. And my final, well, what looks to be my final question to you, Sheikh, inshallah, is that every year we see a considerable amount of people who are not Muslim fasting in Ramadan in solidarity with Muslims. In fact, my former principal, Mr. Kleinans, who's been on this podcast as well, he, I believe he was on the episode just before yours, I can't remember right now. He always used to make a point at school that when Ramadan started, he too would fast and he wouldn't even drink water and stuff like that out of solidarity to Muslims. And this is happening all over the world. And many people come to Islam this way and so on and so forth. What is your advice to these people who are fasting in solidarity with Muslims, although it may not be out of belief that this is a command from God, but they are fasting regardless for whatever reason? What's your advice to these sorts of people? Okay, so it's a few months ago, I had like an open mosque event. And, uh, you know, the people attending, they asked me, it was for non-Muslims to come see what the mosque is about and what, you know, what Islam's about. They asked me like, you know, like what, what to you is like one of the main proofs that Islam is the true religion. And I gave them a few things, du'as being answered, the fitra, you know, but one of the things I told them is experiencing Ramadan. That when you experience the barakah of Ramadan, this shaitan being locked up, uh, the, 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 the spirituality in the masjids, uh, the spirituality of iftar time, of suhoor time, of tarawih, of reciting Quran, you end up with no doubts that this is the true religion. So I encourage non-Muslims that if you want to know more about Islam, if you want to see the effects of Islam, spend time with Muslims in Ramadan. Right? Do what the Muslims are doing, spend time with them, experience that environment. Because the level of baraka and sakina, you know, the level of blessings and and peace and uh, the level of absence of sin and desire for sin that exists during those 29 days is in of itself a proof that this is from Allah and this is the true religion. And, you know, I really believe that a lot of sincere non-Muslims, if they just have to experience that on some level, whether it's through attending iftar or whether it's through spending some time with a Muslim friend or whether it's through watching the tarawih on YouTube or whether it's through fasting, just experiencing that will inshallah bring them closer to Islam and closer to realizing that this is the truth from Allah and hopefully opening the door for them to accept it and experience the beauty of Islam for themselves. And I always say this, that uh, accepting Islam is for oneself. It's something that it, it, it brings barak blessings into your life, peace into your life, purpose into your life, joy into your life. Nothing but good comes out of embracing the truth. And so Ramadan is one of the best times to experience this. You know, it's also one of the best times for dawah because shaitan's locked up. So you're just dealing with a person's nafs, not with the nafs plus shaitan. So it's a great time for dawah. It's a great time for showing people our religion. And yeah, I really encourage him to, to, to keep trying and at the same time study the religion and spend time with Muslims. MashaAllah. We hope that will be of benefit to my very many followers who are non-Muslim. So Alhamdulillah, Sheikh, we've covered a lot of topics. Do you have any parting words for our audience, Muslim, non-Muslim, uh, as we're going into this blessed month of Ramadan? Yeah, make dua for me. <laughs> make dua for me, please. We all need duas. We all have our mistakes and our sins and our weaknesses and our challenges in life. Life is a test and each of us are facing different challenges. So please, if you benefited from anything I said, please make dua for me and for my family and for the work that we do that Allah accepts it from us. You know, my final bit of advice for Ramadan is to renew your intentions. Now, many of us, we fast automatically. Uh, we just do it culturally or we just, you know, do it like a robot. Do this every morning when you wake up for suhoor. In your heart, tell yourself, I am fasting today for Allah. Tell yourself, I'm doing this for Allah. So it becomes a purposeful, intentional, intense intentful act of worship right that you are doing an act of worship with intention with purpose for allah 
it's not just culture it's not just ritual it's not just robotic that that intention is there and this intention will guide you throughout your day it'll protect you from saying things that are displeasing to allah it'll protect you from wasting time it will transform your fasting from a ritual into an act of worship so this is something that i really advise everybody to do you know in some mazhabs they say that making one intention at the beginning of ramadan suffices for all of ramadan that's fine but they're not saying you you, you don't make intention every day they're saying it that's that's the minimum right so we don't we don't want to do the minimum we want to do more than that so making intention every single morning it 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 just renews within you what you are doing so it doesn't become robotic so whether it's for your fasting whether it's for your tarawih whatever it is always remind yourself i am doing this for allah as soon as you remind yourself of that it is elevated to the next level and you will do it in a much better way inshallah so that's my final bit of advice and allah knows best mashallah and we will from everyone at this podcast and everyone who's listening will ask you for duas as well to pray for us for barakah in this life and the next because you you are an alim and if i may quote the hadith in arabic innama al ulama warathatul anbiya that the ulama are the inheritors of the prophets alayhim assalam so i mean i'm what i'm saying is that your duas probably have a, a bit of an extra punch compared to the rest of us such as myself and so on and so forth so jazakallahu khairan sheikh uh, allah knows best jazakallahu like khairan i mean to my mean jazakallahu khairan for coming back once again sheikh ismail after everything that we went through with the aftermath of that first episode but we take it in stride inshallah hopefully inshallah maybe next year or some other time for the next season we will have you on again to talk about other things i know that mj did a lot of well exposing when it comes to you and chasing down big show in dubai and all those things over there and so maybe we'll schedule a wrestling match between sheikh ismail kamdar and mj khan or something like that if that floats your boat and yeah um, one of my other guests imam madhar i'm not sure if you if you saw that episode sheikh but he did ex- um express some intention to have discussions with you if i could set it up so we'll look into that inshallah if you are also consenting to that sure sure sounds fine inshallah well he's he's kind of like you in that he's been blacklisted from the place he studied at because yeah because of many things because like you he's been through a journey and comes to besides being hanafi he comes to these conclusions which are quote unquote unconventional so i think there will be a lot of shared ground for the two of you if you do have that discussion inshallah and may allah make it beneficial i mean i mean so at the end of the day audience viewers listeners we hope that this was an interesting session for you we'll be releasing this in the lead up to ramadan so we ask allah to make this ramadan beneficial for all of us despite the situation we find ourselves in with the pandemic raging on and all these things happening that are just out of our control let's make the best of the cards we've been dealt with and use it as a jumping board to get close to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all and make us see better days amen tumma amen from myself at the scholar and the student to sheikh ismail kamdar and everyone in the viewers assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh peace out well you reached the end well done I guess I'll give you a little bit of a prize by reminding you to like, share and subscribe to our relevant channels. Follow us on all our social media platforms. If you're using Apple Podcasts, do leave us a 5-star rating. And if you think we've earned it, we'd appreciate a one-time donation on Ko-fi or a longer pledge on Patreon. Until next time, stay blessed. Assalamu alaikum.